Welcome to the Fusion Party of Australia Member Profile Podcast. You're very welcome. Take up a seat and listen to what they have to say. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for joining me today. Really good just to catch up again and discuss more about who you are, why you decided to join the Fusion Party. So would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. And thanks for the honour of doing this. Uh, my name is Stephen Schwer. My pronouns are he, him. I've got two children who are 13 and 11. They're the, probably the, the people who keep me busiest in my life. But when I get time to myself, I'm normally in my veggie garden, exploring and camping around Central Australia where I live, playing a bit of backgammon. Uh, I live in Alice Springs, so in the red centre of Australia. Uh, and this is my second stint here. Uh, I was here pre-COVID for just over four years, uh, and I've been here on this stint for seven months now, and, and I'm here for, for quite a period of time for the foreseeable future, as far as I can tell. So yeah, I love it here. I live in regional and rural areas and remote areas for over 20 years. I grew up in Sydney and spent the entire time trying to convince my parents to move to the bush. Uh, and so when it the opportunity for me came after I'd moved out of home to move to the country I did. And apart from the short stint living in Brisbane last year, I've lived in uh, regional and rural areas ever since. A bit of a synopsis of, of, yeah, who I am and where I've come from. That's good. That's good to be um, moving around because it gives you a lot more exposure to different perspectives and different ways of living in Australia. Yeah, absolutely. I've, uh, I've lived in the Cinders Ranges in Birdsville, in Mackay, I've lived in quite a few different places and, and I just, I love it. I, I feel more at home in regional and, and particularly remote areas. I'm a bit of a hermit that way. I, I do like wide open spaces and time to myself to just sit and think and, and I find the remote living allows you to do that. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I'd, I'll have to ask you later about uh, what type of lifestyle you have that allows you to move around and only and, and to explore open spaces like that. That sounds pretty cool. But let's jump straight into why you're even with Fusion Party. So uh, I'm very curious, how did you hear about us and what was it that compelled you to go over the line and say, yeah, I'm joining this party? So I'm 45, but politics is actually a fairly new thing to me. Up until about five or ten years ago, yeah, probably close to ten years ago, I had never voted in an election. Um, and I know that you've chatted with a few other Fusion Party members who have come out of a conservative religious background. That is also something that I've had as an experience in my life. I grew up in a fairly conservative Christian community in Australia, a religious community. So you were, um, you grew up in a conservative Christian environment and you said you hadn't voted? That's correct. And part of the tenets of the faith that I used to be a member of were conscientious objections. So not involving yourself in any politics or any affairs of the state mm. uh, as, as much as you possibly could. So, mm. which was actually quite bizarre because I spent a bit of time in my career being a, a lobbyist as part of my role, not it wasn't my total role to be a lobbyist on behalf of the tourism industry that, that used to be my career, uh, but part of my role used to include lobbying political figures for uh, outcomes that supported the tourism industry. So it was interesting that I was lobbying people who I, I actually had no affinity with because I didn't vote, I didn't get myself involved in politics. So when I came out of that group, I started to think a lot more about the political world and and the, the changes that I wanted to see. And so as I started voting, I, I valued my vote very highly. And so each time I vote now, I research every single independent and party that is on the ballot. Uh, I'm one of these people who numbers every single option uh, below the line to, to, wow. to solidly work out my, my preferences and do it my own way based on the values that I have and where they align with the individuals and the parties that run in, in the election. So uh, that's how I came to Fusion, is in the federal election, living in Brisbane for 10 months last year, and the federal election was on at the time, and I did some research on all the different parties, and it was Fusion that spoke to me. There were a couple of other parties and independents as well, uh, but the more I looked at the policies, uh, Fusion was the 
handout for me that I I really felt had similar values to mine in terms of secularism, uh, the separation of church and state, the facing things in, in science, looking at innovation, all, all sorts of areas like that, um, humanitarian ideals. So yeah, I, I had a look at all of those things and I thought this is a, a party that you know I, I felt comfortable voting for in the Senate. And so then it, it just kind of went from there. I kept an eye on what Fusion was doing and then recently there was a membership drive and I saw the email in my inbox and I thought, yeah, why not? I'll grab my hat in the ring to be a member of Fusion. Well, thank you very much. And I think it's really nice when people do uh, take a chance and they join a party because it means that they're open to being part of a, a community of like-minded people. And it's always really interesting to learn more from everyone in that community. So when I first spoke to you, you were telling me about uh, your work lobbying with the government. And um, so I want to know more about that. But before we move to that, I'm just curious. So you are you came from a conservative Christian background. You said you joined up with Fusion because you appreciated the secularist side of it. I'm just curious, what is the main driver for that? secularist view yeah sure i i like the idea of absolutely freedom of speech freedom of worship freedom of religion because people are entitled to believe what they believe but i also think that at some point fact and evidence must outweigh belief um, because facts don't care about people's beliefs and so the separation of church and state Secularism, I think, is important to make sure that reasonable, rational, logical, and evidence based decisions are made rather than decisions made purely on ideology. And I'm not saying that ideology can't come into those decisions, because of course they will, but ideology cannot be the, the pure driver of decisions, in, especially when you're making decisions that are supposed to be for the good of an entire nation. I agree, yeah. But when you're saying about evidence-based, it's to drive towards having the best outcome for the largest amount of people. So it's very utilitarian and also has a bit of trust behind it because it's based on something that could be universally accepted and more likely to be credible than um, pure ideology. And so I like what you said there that, it's not just driven by ideology because I think that can be tenuous sometimes with the long-term vision, but evidence-based is always just a lot more fair. That's true. And one thing I would say, though, is evidence-based is not always the most popular way to do something. And, And I think one of the things that I've been disappointed with in, in the general population is the lack of trust that they have in institutions and organisations that have the, the community's best interests at heart. And, and I think that was particularly evident, for example, through, through the COVID period where people weren't trusting of the research behind a lot of the, the vaccines and things like that, where I'm not a doctor, I'm not a medical researcher, so of course I'm not going to understand the work that has gone into the bits and pieces behind those vaccines. But I am a believer in the scientific process because the scientific process has evidence to show why it works. And so, of course, the things with the, the scientific process, the, the, the results of that have led to a way of saving lives. So, of course, we need to trust it. But um, that's just one example of where the community's trust in institutions and organisations and the scientific process uh, hasn't been there. However, a good still came out of it. And so I, I do find that a difficult thing. How do you convince people who refuse to be convinced about the efficacy of a particular decision if it's based in evidence? I, I, mm. that's yeah, I guess the question is how do we grow or instill trust in the public, in our institutions? How do we, how do we even support that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I'd love to know, <laughs> I'd love there to be a silver bullet, but I think it's a, a range of different things. And that's why, that's another reason why I think Fusion has some good ideas about uh, how how that kind of thing might happen. So mm-hmm. um, that's yeah, another, another reason. Certainly do. And yeah, 
we will be discussing more about that, about how to grow trust by, a, you know, better integrity, supporting um, better integrity by clearer accountability and transparency. So very important priority for Fusion Party. The other thing I wanted to ask was, so you've been moving around quite a bit. Would you like to share why that is and how that also forms your your view of uh, Australia, your values and what you'd like for the future in Australia? Yeah, sure. So the first reason I moved, and, and so each move has been for a different reason. The first move that I made from Sydney to country Victoria at the time was purely economically driven. Living in Sydney, I was a travel agent. I then worked a little bit in tourism research for a private enterprise that was a startup company. And then 9-11 happened and there wasn't all that much work for private tourism researchers mm. in Sydney uh, post 9-11 and, and especially when ANSET at the time was going under, there were travel agents uh, chains going under and I, I was actually laid off as were about 100 other people at the time of the organisation I was working with. Pure economics meant that it was time to move to country Victoria, picked up a, a few casual jobs, ended up working at an information centre uh, in Nagambi, in central Victoria, started teaching at TAFE. Then the move started happening because of being on contract. So I ended up running regionally based, membership based tourism organisations representing regional tourism industry to government and to the wider community. So I lived in the Flinders Ranges and also Central Australia in Alice Springs. And each of those was between a two and a four year contract. So each time the, the contract period comes up, you've got to start looking for another job. So I've, I've traveled and lived all over. And I just, I love, particularly in the remote areas, the wide open skies, the, the crystal clear night, the space to think, the lack of a commute time. So you've actually got a life. You don't mm -hmm. uh, have to be constantly rushing everywhere and, wondering if you're going to miss the train because in Birdsville, I, I was a two-block walk from where I work. In Alice Springs, you're only 15 minutes from everything else. 15-minute <laughs> city. <laughs> yeah, you, exactly. And the, all of the hoo-ha that people make over, once again, ideologically driven over the 15-minute city, I think wait until you've lived in one and you will be absolutely converted to the concept because you do have a life and you've got the ability to, to do things and to enjoy yourself and to enjoy time with your family, uh, which I certainly didn't have. With me. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, yeah, how is it that spending time with friends and family or, or the whole reason why we even have work and earn money to better support the things that fulfil us and give us good things in life, it's just funny how it always seems to be undervalued when it comes to talking about employment, economy, quality of life, well-being and Australia, we don't really prioritize the whole well-being aspect of being a productive country, which is allowing a lot more time to spend it at home and with friends and not commuting and not waiting for the mail to come in and, and things like that. So just 15 minute cities, I like that. It's accelerating progress. Yeah. And I, I think the introduction of transport options, when I lived for 10 months in Brisbane last year, I was living with my mother um, in a small apartment in Chermside. And what I love about, even though after 10 months I was done living in a city again and I had to move bush again, what I loved is that given the location and given the cycling infrastructure and the, tra the public transport infrastructure, I was able to just use, I, I bought an e-scooter and I used all the bike lanes to, to commute. And, if, and because you can take your e-scooter on trains there, I, I used the train system and, and my e-scooter and was pretty much able to get wherever I needed to be. Uh, so I do think if we can't have that 15-minute city concept, these larger cities have really got to work out why they are reliant on cars and how they can reduce that mm -hmm. because the more parking spaces you need, the less space you have for housing, for businesses, things like that, and, and work out how you can actually be a commutable city using innovation, using um, things like e-bikes and e-scooters and public transport and, and car sharing and ride sharing and all these kinds of wonderful ways that we now have um, 
to, to be able to get around rather than just our constant reliance on one person behind the wheel of a large vehicle. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when we see traffic jams in Sydney, I can see there are so many cars uh, in the lanes with just one person in there. And that's, yeah, that's heartbreaking. I think... Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense and it contributes to the loneliness that uh, I think a lot of people feel where they, they are driving city, heaving with people, but are doing it alone. It's, yeah. It's, a, it's quite a bizarre concept. Exactly. We're all um, pretty much living uh, single units, all a little bit in isolation. I mean, I'm not meaning to generalise, but I think living in a very big, dense, anonymous kind of city does paradoxically create more loneliness because of that rat race. Everyone is just trying to figure out how to secure enough money to stay, but then we don't have enough time to have fun and, and to relax and unwind in between shifts. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, um, and then besides that as well, all the commuting means that we have uh, more pollution in the air. I think, I think that hasn't been so topical in the news. Besides climate um, pollution, I mean, it impacts your breathing, it impacts your skin, it impacts your health, and and so that would make us even more miserable. But we just we end up working harder so we can afford the vitamins and supplements to make us feel better. <laughs> one one of my jobs way back years ago we're talking 20 years ago now i used to work at a pool bar at a five star hotel in, in the city in sydney and one of the most common jobs wasn't making cocktails at this pool bar it was wiping down the tables and the sun lounges because of the amount of pollution that would land on them on this wow. pool bar hotel um and that was 20 years ago i Shudder to think what it's like now. I used to and where was this? Four, four to five times a shift. This was in right down in the rocks, actually, in, in Sydney, um, right down at, at just next to the Harbour Bridge. And, uh, oh. yeah, it was, it was quite quite amazing. Yeah, four to five times a shift, I'd get a wet cloth and wipe all of the pollution off all the tables and sun chairs. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, that's... That's, that's devastating. Okay. All right. So also just want to check with you. You said that you were having a look between fusion and reason. So this is something that comes up. People say, you know, what's the difference between you two? What was it that tipped you over the edge towards fusion? Um, reason is a really interesting party and it is definitely one that I, I highly rate. And I think the focus on innovation and the scientific process that Fusion talks about and, and the incorporation of climate emergency uh, are probably the, the things that tipped me over uh, to support the cause. For, for me, it was the, the innovation focus and the climate emergency focus of Fusion that, that tipped me because <laughs> you really see climate change in action in a place that has always, yes, for many, many years in Central Australia has always, has always been hot, but it's even getting hotter and earlier and longer. And it's really quite palpable. Even out here where it's always been known to be hot, you, you can even see each summer just getting hotter and getting longer. And that's in a desert area, let alone some of the colder areas down to the south of the country, which aren't having their big ski seasons anymore and this kind of thing. So I look at that and I really do think there is a climate emergency. I've got two kids, 13 and 11. I want them to have a world that is habitable. Uh, I want, if they have kids, if they choose to have kids, I want a world that where their kids can actually inhabit it. So that it was the focus is on those topics that, that I think pushed me towards fusion. Yeah, for sure. And thanks for sharing that. I mean, I think when people have children, they anticipated that their children would have at least as a minimum just as good an upbringing as what you have as a parent and it's devastating to think that they're really going to be struggling besides you know not being able to afford housing and uh, the threat of AI and wage stagnation there's now also can we actually even inhabit this earth and with the climate emergency I think people are not really seeing the flow on effects of potential climate refugees and then having 
disasters where it affects access to the energy grid or access to food and supply chain. It's not just about the weather getting a bit hot or more likely to have more rain. It's so much. Uh, We're all quite connected. And I think that's what all these global disasters keep reminding us that we don't live in isolation and what we do on one side of the world can heavily impact another side of the world. So, yeah. Absolutely. And and that... That is a real uh, climate refugees is going to be a massive challenge because uh, that's going to involve all sorts of things like ever increasing failing crop seasons and things like that. So lack of food, scarcity of, of food and, and weather changes, rising seas, all of those kinds of things are going to cause some pretty serious outcomes. And I look even just in, in the industry that I used to work in in tourism, even just that one industry. When you talk about things like the ski fields in, in southern Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, these kinds of incredible natural wonders that we've used for tourism purposes, the amount of just lost income just in one industry in tourism is going to be exponential as climate change increases. And that's just one industry, let alone you know, all the other industries out there that are going to suffer from climate change impact. So it's it's, I, it's a lot to Kevin deal Rudd, with. Yeah, Kevin Rudd once called it the the greatest existential threat or, or the greatest existential threat to humankind or something like that. I can't remember the exact words he used, but ever since he said that, it's kind of pardon the pun, gone off the boil and it, it's not been much of a focus until the last federal election where some of the seals were elected in on that basis, but I'm still not seeing a huge amount of action. Um, mm. and I'd like to see a lot more than there is. It feels like it's a bit of a wait and see sort of approach at the moment. It's not a race, that kind of thing coming back, yeah. which is worrying because I think I'm I'm more worried about everyone realising how unprepared we were when things start to really hit the fan. Very scary. I'm old enough to remember, I'm old enough to remember when um, CFCs were removed from packaging um, mm-hmm. and the world got together, came up with a solution, science-based, to the ever-increasing hole in the ozone layer, and it worked. And why we can't take that same approach to climate change, I do not know. I don't understand it. Yeah, I remember that too, the CFCs. So there were uh, additives that were added to a few aerosols that people could have access to amongst other products, but the CFC chemicals were destroying the ozone layer that would protect us from UV rays and everyone globally banded together, got rid of CFCs. And yeah, I would really like to see that happen again for climate. I don't know what's holding it up. I have a few ideas, but I wish (laughs) they would just get over it. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) <laughs> um, so I'm curious, you live in Alice Springs and you said it's getting hotter and hotter every year. So I'm curious, teach people like myself, who's just, you know, in a city, Sydney, give us a bit of insight into what it's like on the ground there. So what, what, how do people respond to things getting hotter there? Uh, it depends on the person. And once again, their ideological, political, religious, education background and how they interpret it through the lens of their own upbringing. And that's that's the thing. I, I can tell you through my lens um, what it's like for me, but I obviously can't speak for everyone here. But uh, for me, I, I love my veggie gardening. And what it means for me is I'm planting what would normally be in somewhere like Sydney or Melbourne would be your spring planting. I, I generally am... I used to, when I, when I was here seven years ago, I was planting those kinds of items like basil, thyme, you know, some of those herbs and capsicum and tomatoes and things like that that you want to see fruiting in late spring to early summer. I was planting those in about August, approximately. Uh, I'm now planting all of those in July in Alice Springs, right in the middle of winter, so that they're not getting burned off by the, the early summer that comes along. And that's doing all the usual things, putting, putting them under shade cloth, planting under trees instead of in the full sun, that kind of thing. Because things that normally would have full sun in this kind of climate, you have to have in shade. 
but yeah, I, I'm noticing that I'm planting things a month earlier now than than I used to seven years ago when I eight years ago when I first came here. So so that's just one small example of of how things are changing. More and more fire danger days, and we've got a severe issue in Central Australia with grazing grass called buffalo grass that was introduced for the cattle industry. It is a weed, even though it's not a declared weed in the NT. Uh, there's a campaign at the moment to get it declared a weed because it takes over the Spinifex ground. Uh, and the problem with that is that Spinifex, obviously through a process of evolution, has adapted to be able to deal with, with uh, bushfire. The buffalo grass hasn't. It turns hotter and more easily than our native grasses do. So it creates a severe fire risk. So the, the summer, with the, the heat of the summer coming on and the introduction of this weed, our, our bushfire seasons are becoming more and more drastic as well. So there's just a couple of ways. In fact, we had a bushfire here recently where the ash was falling on the town. It was about oh, three weeks ago now. Uh, the West McDonnell Rangers, Jodhaja, to the west of town, had a bushfire and we were getting buffalo grass ash blowing on us in town here. So it's already started the, the bushfire season here. Oh, wow. So, I mean, I didn't see anything about that in the media on my end, but is this uh, something that happens every year, do you think, or were people alarmed about the bushfires happening three weeks ago? It's increasingly happening every year. So, yes, we would have been alarmed a few years back, but these days it's just a a common occurrence. So Mm -hmm. everyone was kind of saying, oh, yeah, the the bushfires started early again. Oh, God. And to what you were saying about planting things a little bit earlier, uh, so normally I really love it when we come into spring and the jasmine starts to bloom and you can really, you really know that the sweet spring summer is on its way when you start to smell that jasmine blooming at night. The jasmine's already started blooming uh, at least a month before winter ended. So yeah, it's happening everywhere. I'm also curious. So I know, um, Dutton has a, a soft spot in his heart for Alice Springs. What's your experience been like since rumours that there's a lot of crime in Alice Springs? What are the conversations you've heard in Alice Springs and, and what is your take on that as well? Yeah, sure. Look, politically, this is a very, very interesting town. So it's unlike any other town of 20,000 people that you're ever likely to come across because it is politically, creatively, innovatively, and ideologically diverse. You've got basically a distillation of Australia in this one little town of 20,000 people. So uh, there's, we, we even have distinct little enclaves of different people. Generally speaking, everyone knows that the, the creatives live in the suburb of East Side, um, on the east side of the Todd River in town. It's, you know, this, this kind of thing, it's, it's quite a, a creative community. It's quite a diverse community. And so politically, the reason that all prime ministers that I can think of have visited of any persuasion is because they have very solid support in, in Alice Springs, not just soft support, but very much active branches of political organisations in Alice Springs. So... The, the CLP here, the Country Liberal Party, which is similar to the LNP in Queensland and is known as the Liberals and the Nationals in any other state, the, the elections are always close here or, or have been traditionally quite close. There's been a few blowouts in recent years, but that's mainly to do with personalities of people standing rather than political ideology. Generally, it's a 50-50 mix here in, in the NT. And so you get people like... Tony Abbott, when he was Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, when he was Prime Minister, Peter Dutton, now that, now that he's the opposition leader, coming to Alice Springs because it brings with it that feeling of the real Australia, that, that mythology that, that Australians have in their mind about what the real Australia is. Alice Springs embodies that. So it brings that with it when they're having their uh, cuts to camera on, on uh, media interviews. But it also brings with it very supportive people. doesn't matter which political persuasion. There will always be very ardent members of that political party in Alice Springs who will support that message. Um, and in Alice Springs, everyone knows everyone. 
everyone is, is connected to everyone in some way, shape or form. So even though you've got these mass, massive differences in political ideology, everyone knows that they just have to get along because you're going to see each other, you're going to bump into each other on aisle six at the supermarket at some point. So you've got to, you've got to get along. So it's, it's a really interesting distillation of Australian, um, a, a distillation of Australia in this, this small town. Yeah, very interesting community there. So it's in the middle of Australia. It's such an icon to Australian culture, this desert heartland. Because it's so remote and inland, it's also less susceptible to the winds of change like um, Sydney or Melbourne could be. So there's a bit of a, a respect of the stability of culture there as well. So I think that's a very interesting perspective and it explains why people like to take a stand on what's affecting Alice Springs. Yeah, it, culturally it's an interesting one because, of course, uh, so it is the land of the Aranda people, so the First Nations group in, in Mbantua, um, which is the, the First Nations Aranda word for Alice Springs. It's their home. It's where they've been for, for thousands of years. Uh, and so you hear Aranda spoken because it's the first language of quite a lot of people in town. So you hear that uh, spoken all the time in town. You also hear quite a lot of Pitjantjara because the APY lands is only a little bit to the south of here. And there are a number of other First Nations languages that you hear in town if people come down from Tennant Creek or you know, some of the outlying communities, you hear the different, the different languages quite a bit because for them, it's their, that's their first language. That's their, 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 their spoken language at home. So you, culturally, it's quite interesting that way. And then, of course, culturally, because it's an international tourism draw card, people... Once again, this mythology of the real Australia, what's the outback like? Uh, so you get this really interesting mix of cultural melting pot of, of European and American uh, people, because of course we've got the Pine Gap uh, military base here as well. So we've got a lot of Americans that live in town. So it's a really interesting cultural mix here. That sounds very interesting. Yeah, I'm very intrigued to go check out Pine Gap. Yeah, you can't get too close to it, but there's plenty of places where you can see it from afar, and and um, there's there's always the joke is in town that uh, everyone with an American accent is either a landscape gardener or a maintenance worker, because you ask anyone, oh, oh so you work out at the gap, what, what's your job? Oh, I'm a I'm a landscape gardener or I'm a maintenance uh, worker. That's hilarious. <laughs> That's a joke in town. <laughs> Some of the more honest ones, you might get them to admit that they're a mathematician. <laughs> but that's about as close as you'll get. <laughs> wow, yeah, national security. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, cool. And so are you considering living in Alice Springs for a while or do you have another place in Australia in the future? Look, I love it here. And, and my kids go to school here. My son is at the Steiner School. And my daughter is at one of the private schools here because uh, she's a little bit older, so she's in high school. My son's in primary school. They they love it here. They've got the friends group. They know all of the kids in town. And when I say all of the kids in town, they know all of the kids in town. Um, and, and so it makes it a nice experience because you go for a walk and they always bump into someone they know and I'll bump into someone I know. Um, yeah, and so because of that, they my son loves Football, so he, he plays soccer at uh, the Vikings Football Club here in town. My daughter is, is a scout, so she's a member of the local scout group. And they've, they're at very good schools in a really nice town where they get a lot more opportunities than they would if they lived in in the city because you're not as anonymous here. You're, you're known. And a lot of services and a lot of organisations have outreaches here and so because of that uh, you, you do end up with a lot of opportunities. My daughter has had the opportunity to sing with the Australian singer-songwriter poet Ted Egan before. She's had the opportunity to sing with Warren H. Williams with the Soweto Gospel Choir. You, you just don't get those kinds of uh, opportunities. My, my son's part of the Northern Australian Football Academy who was selected for that. You, you get all of these opportunities in, in this town that you just wouldn't normally get if you lived in a, in a big city because you're one of many as opposed to one of a few. Um, yeah. So you end up being a, everyone is a big fish in a small pond here. 
whereas you move to a big city and you're a, a very small fish in a very big pond. Well, and besides the um, exposure to a stronger network and of connections in a community, it's more efficient because I think if you live in a big city where there's uh, it's a lot of anonymity, it means they have to spend a lot more time trying to verify if someone says who they say they are. So there's a lot more proving your identity before you can get access to certain services or opportunities. Whereas if everyone already knows each other and they they already have a gauge of what people's strengths and values are, it's a lot easier to collaborate and to share um, opportunities and information. But yeah, in 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 an anonymous city, there's a lot more uh, process to jump through. Yeah, I I was going to, absolutely, I agree. Um, One of the issues with that is you can be unfair. If if something happens and the the gossip mill gets going, you can be unfairly treated because of what people have heard, because everyone is so close to, to the situation. But I also find that even in those kinds of cases, gradually people still get along with each other because you have to, because you are in a, a remote location and you are going to bump into each other all the time. So, mm. so yeah, yeah, but, but that is it's one. It's a lot more humane. Point. Yeah, it is. It is. A lot more compassion and, and just humanity, appreciating that because, yeah, we're not perfect and, yeah, you really do have to prioritise getting along and so that means accepting people's um, imperfections. So that's beautiful. Yeah. Is there anything else um, you, that you'd really like to share? Yeah, look, I suppose going back to one of the reasons I joined Fusion, I suppose I, I just want to mention where I think the policies of Fusion end up leading to is is where I I have a vision for Australia and and the world. So so we I mentioned before things like the evidence based decision making. Um, the scientific process, looking at the climate emergency, the the issue of um, separation of church and state, all of these kinds of things. The reason I think that they're important is because they lead somewhere good. They lead somewhere positive. In my opinion, if we're looking for a more empathic Australia, if we're if we're looking at equity for all as a base from which we can help people uh, self actualize, if we if we're looking at valuing facts, all of these things eventually lead to a world where things like rehabilitation is valued over punishment, a world where you can be friends with other nation states whilst holding different values, but not having to have trade freezes and and chilling of relationships with other nation states and, God forbid, war and, and these kinds of issues. You can still hold true to your values and be, in essence, a neutral group with, while still holding other people to account for things like humanitarian issues and those kinds of things. I think it leads to a far more empathic and a far more retrospective and introspective world that then through that process is able to deal more effectively with each other. What, what concerns me is I, I look out at ideologically driven nations and I see the seeds of war or actual war uh, going on. And, and I think we need to be very, very cautious about those things. And that's why I think the policies of fusion are so important because they lead to a, a really nice place of what is the best for the, the most amount of people. How can we make the world a better place? It sounds idealistic, but it's not if you follow those kinds of policies. So, yeah, so I think that's why I really like the look of fusion. I, I like, you know, but even just policies that fusion has of things like free education at all life stages for all, that idea of lifelong learning, that it can do nothing but help an, a, a country. And I'm not talking just economically, because yes, it will help economically, but it helps the more educated people are, the more they are, uh, the more they have empathy for others and the more they un- have understanding and wisdom. So yeah, that's a, 
getting off my soapbox now, but yeah, that's that's some of the reasons why I think yeah that I I, I really the the policy of exclusion really stood out to me. Thank you that you've articulated that beautifully. I think what you were saying about education, I think as well as ha- people having better ability for empathy with other viewpoints and perspectives, it also allows them to effectively articulate potential solutions. What we see from some of the parties that we have in Australia, they they focus on particular issues that they're concerned with. But I think what Fusion is really trying to articulate is a narrative of how we want Australia to have a better future, considering all issues and all perspectives. I mean, we can solve issue by issue, but overall, we will always have issues and and things that we need to solve, but we need to be thinking about a, a greater and grander vision that we want in Australia, and that's what Fusion is pioneering. So thank you yeah, for that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, that's, and that's where context is key. I, I, I really do think a party that has the context of where it wants to be uh, is, is going to be far more effective than a party that is just a, a small issue base or jumps up and down about single issues because it's ignoring those issues. It's the focusing on those issues and ignoring the, the general context of how that particular issue contrib- contributes to a wider picture. So that's, that's why exactly. I like the policy of inclusion. Thank you. Yeah, just aiming for a cogent, holistic story of why we even exist and what we want to see rather than, oh, we need to fix taxes or we need to fix this and that because everything has flow and effects and implications on other things. So have to be holistic about it. So thank you. It's yeah. really it's good to have like-minded people like you in our community to help support what we want to bring to the rest of Australia. So thank you. Thank you. And that was episode of Fusion Party's member profile podcast, listening to people who bank on a new and emerging party to voice what they would like to see in Australia's future. Thank you for listening.